Thank you, singers, musicians, and worship leaders. We are happy to be back. But I have to say, someone said to me this morning that they were watching the services. I forgot who said it, so don't take offense if you're here. I, I don't even remember who said it, but it was funny. And they said, when we watched, I felt so bad for you because you kept wiping your face. So just put a disclaimer out there. Don't feel bad for me. That is one of my happy places to be. And I go prepared with face mops. I guess so that, that's what we could call them. Yeah, the heat was, was intense, um, hotter than the other two years we've been there, actually. And that's actually a, been a subject of conversation in Liberia because of the global warming and the climate issues. So just pray that it doesn't get hotter next year. I had my little battery-operated fan, and um, we may do. We just, you know, you just do. When you are in Africa, there's a saying that says TIA. Dr. Wins taught us that many years ago. TIA, and that stands for This is Africa. And that is not in a negative connotation at all. We love, love Africa. And so, yeah, we were drinking a lot of water and just letting our pores get rid of it because it was hot. But thank you for watching. We saw so much activity on the services and, and likes and comments. And, and so we know that you guys were actively involved in this trip and in this conference. And we, this morning, even before my husband mentioned it, is it Ephesians 3.20. God, and just tying that in with what Bernard said, when you just give what God asks you to give to him, it's exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think that he gives back to you. I'm just telling you from experience, the five fish and the two loaves, or the five loaves and the two fish, whatever it was, was small. But that boy gave it. And I never viewed it like that, Bernard. That was good. And I hope he didn't get in trouble when he got home that day. From... But God has done exceedingly abundantly above anything that we could have even asked or hoped for. Um, thank you to such a wonderful pastor. And, and please, you know, I mean this sincerely. This is a missions-minded church, and that comes from your leaders. And the man that planted this church almost 35 years ago that we are getting ready to have a big celebration, he is a missions-minded man. Globally and locally, as you see the events that Pastor Maureen has as well in, the, in our communities. And so I want to say thank you because without that, I wouldn't have the opportunity. I have many, many colleagues in ministry that have never stepped foot out of the country. And I don't say that to criticize, but I say it because I know God has given me an opportunity that I never want to squander. Is it a long trip? Yes. Is it hard? Yes. Is it painful and, and weary? Yes. But the dividends that come from obeying God far any feelings of exhaustion. So we are still jet lagging a little bit, but we're back and we're, we're excited to share with you some of the things that happen. So Richard or Richie, as I affectionately call you from time to time, thank you. And Bernard, I can't even, I don't even know what to say. You were an armor bearer. You were a wonderful preacher. You connected with the Liberian people. And we are grateful, grateful that you were there, part of that ministry team. One thing that I will share was the last service, usually Pastor Zebe asked me to open the conference on Wednesday and then close it on Sunday afternoon. And so by Sunday afternoon, I will just tell you, and Pastor Zebe and his wife may watch this at some point, it was hot, and there was dancing, and there was praising, and there was more dancing. And you have no idea. I wanted to get down on that floor with those women and do that dancing. But I'm telling myself, I'm, I'm already exhausted. I'm so hot. My battery fan's starting to make a slower whir sound, which means that it's losing its charge. And um, I just was hot, and then Bernard went out and came back and said one of the dancers that had performed had fainted from the heat. So now he's asking me, are you okay? I've got my husband here 
praying for me. I've got myself and Bernard, and are you okay? Are you going to be okay? And I said, I'm going to be fine. And then I said to myself, are you sure about that? And at one point, I just, I had my hair kind of up, but it was still on my neck, and I just thought, I, I got to get this hair up as high as it'll go, because it's hot. But I'm going to tell you, when, I, when, when my time finally came, I got behind that pulpit, and I said to my husband, I looked at him, and I said, I have nothing right now. I don't know how I'm going to do this. You know, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And it was just saying it to him and saying it to the Lord. But when I got behind that pulpit, the Lord blessed and strengthened and anointed and gave me what I needed for that moment because I'm just the vessel. It's okay to tell God, I have nothing. I mean, I'm here to minister for you, but there's nothing in here. And God goes, yeah, that's what I want to hear. Because that's when we put ourselves aside. And when you get to the point of absolute exhaustion and, and affected by the heat, God will take care of it. And he did for all of us. Bernard kept saying, I have never felt heat like this. And that, it just, that struck me funny because you are from neighboring Sierra Leone. But it was, it was wonderful. God just, his touch was upon me. And that directly relates to your prayers. We do not say hollow thank yous. We are not giving you hollow, grateful hearts. We, our hearts are full because we knew and I knew and my husband and Bernard, when we were able to do what we needed to do when it was our session, God came through. And so thank you for your prayers. We, we do not take that lightly. Um, one of the things that brought me the most joy outside of going back to the room in the air conditioning, were the people. The reception that we receive from the people, the church, the pastors that travel. One traveled, uh, one pastor, he, he's come, I believe, three years. He travels very rough terrain for about 14 hours, I believe. 11 hours and then three hours, uh, another mode of transportation. So, you know, we're going... And we can't just give this little Sunday school lesson. We are going to minister to people that have traveled on roads that would never be called roads here, through heat, through exhaustion, with no money, hungry, whatever their, their situation is. We need something for, from God for them. And God did that. And their reception was unreal. I feel the minute we walk onto that property, I feel so loved. I feel so accepted because the, the first time I went to Africa was Kenya in 2013. And honestly, I went and I said, God, I, I don't even know. I don't even know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how I can relate to the women and the men in this country. And I won't go into that story, but God spoke to me and he showed me we're all the same. I don't care what country you live in. I don't care what, what family you're from or what job situation you have. We are all people. We all have blood flowing in our veins. Our skin might be different. Our culture might be different. What we eat might be different. We ate a lot of rice every single day. And it was so good, Nettie. It was so good, Andrew, every day. Love the rice. But we felt so received. And the smiles and the appreciation and the hug after hug after hug after hug. Wonderful, wonderful embracing from the people. And another thing that blessed me is the servanthood of those teams. These women that cooked our lunch every single day, when one morning we arrived, I don't know if you saw the picture, and we arrived to the side of the building, and I, said, and I saw the giant, giant pots. And I said, I want to go see what they're cooking. That's our lunch. Let's go see them. And I remembered a couple of the women from before. So we all got together. We took a picture. I took a picture of the food, and I told them. And every day we were, we were, we were really wanted to make sure we told people. The people that were cleaning up, the people that were doing the bathrooms, that were cooking the food, they were hot too, but they worked tirelessly, and they believed that God had us there, and God had something for them. And so what really impressed me was their servanthood as well. And we're grateful for that here at Victory. Listen, keep a servant's heart. You will be blessed with your servant's heart. What you do unto the Lord is what matters. We do for each other, of course. We, 
we are always uh, uh, trying to get new people on different ministries and teams and signing people up, but you're ultimately doing it for the Lord. So again, I would ask you, as Bernard said, what is in your basket? What is in your basket? That's a good sermon title. What is in your basket? The joy of the women um, that I would personally spend a little bit of time with. There was a, a language barrier with some of the older women. But you can tell by the look on their face and my face, there was love. There was a connection. There was an appreci a, a dual appreciation. Um, the older women that sing in the choir, man, they sing and they dance and they sing and they dance. And uh, Pastor Zebe's wife, Mother Comfort, he, she always says, if I go to church and I don't dance, then I didn't go to church. And when I tell you, I, she dances. I don't know how she has ener any energy left, but she does it. And that, that just struck me. May we be worshipers with all that is in, within us, with everything that's in us. May we not hold back. We were created to praise the whole premise of the conference was praise. We have women of Judah coming up. We're going to talk about praise. The whole reason God created us is to praise him. And when we do that, we get free. I was a little heavy-hearted heavy myself this morning, just over a little thing that, that came up this weekend. And I went in the cafe, and we were praying. And I, and I went over to my husband. After a few minutes of praying, I said, I, that burden belongs to God. What am I holding on to this for? That's yours, God. You take that burden. And I really felt like he lifted that. And sometimes he lifts things and things don't change, but this lifts, our heart lifts, our, our, our soul and our spirit lifts. And so praise and worship are the most important things outside of prayer that, that we can have as a real big part of our life. My husband will share a little bit more about a young man, but I, I just have to mention it without go, going into the details because I know you want to share that. The joy that we receive is when one person comes to Christ. And I said to my husband, he'll tell you the story about this young man. If we went to Liberia only for this one young man, then that's why we went to Liberia. Because, see, we don't know the countless other people that this young man can touch and minister to. So I, uh, that, I don't want to share the story because you want to, but I, I just had to mention that was a very exciting, exciting event that happened. And then some of you may have seen the first night outside, the women in the purple headpieces. We got there, and they were already worshiping and singing, and they don't wait for, like, worship leaders. They're just, like, worshiping and singing, and then somebody goes to the mic, and then someone else goes. But they were singing, and I saw all... They, and they did this last year, too, the purple headpieces. And I sat there outside in the blazing heat, hair getting bigger by the second from the humidity, and I just began to weep. I just sat there and watched them silently weeping, saying, thank you, Jesus. It all started with the purple Women of Judah, 13 years. Judah Conference Liberia, three years. That, and, you know, I said to my husband the other night, I never realized this. Growing up, I don't really have a favorite color anymore, but growing up, my favorite color was purple. I had everything purple. Shirts, pants, when corduroys were in, which I think they're back in, corduroys. Purple corduroys, purple, purple. And so it's interesting now that that color purple represents so much in my life and in our lives, and even as a church, in what God is doing here. So that was, a real, um, that was a real exciting thing for me. Even some of the men on Sunday had purple T-shirts. Purple T-shirts. Women all purpled out because they know what that means. They know. They watch. They, they're a part of this uh, Women of Judah Conference, too, via live stream quite often. So, And then the last thing I will share before my husband comes, and we're... Um, Pastor Terry, you can just get that little video clip ready. As you know, we raised finances to take to Liberia and buy a transformer. 
for this church. We've been the two times and the electricity goes out constantly, which means the fans go out and the mic goes out and everything goes out. But we keep going. We keep preaching or singing or talking. Whatever's happening, the singers, we just keep going until it comes back on. But two years ago in 2022, uh, the, we had been to Liberia the one time and when we came back, God had shown us that that's what we needed to do for our Liber uh, Women of Judah project for our offering. And so we presented that to the people, and the Women of Judah conference raised around $5,000, and then other money, right, right? That's, that's a good amount of money. We, are, we have generous Women of Judah. And then more money began to uh, continue to come in after the conference through the link that we kept open from different places, both within and without the church, outside the church. And so we were able to take $8,500 to not only buy the transformer, because you have to, when you're doing a project, you've pretty much got to do the whole thing so that it gets done. So it was to purchase the transformer and also for the installation. So this project is going to be done. We thank you for your giving, for your faithfulness in giving and praying, praying for us. And just um, when we presented this to the church, I'm hoping the quality is going to be good. But TIA, my friends, TIA. But be blessed by this video clip. I know. <laughs> In Jesus' name. And we had a wonderful discussion. We're not just sitting over lunch, but they did something. And I think that thing they did yesterday. They should come and do it before all of you here today, the good news family. God bless you. Good morning, wonderful good news assembly of God. We are so blessed to be here, to be part of what God's doing in Liberia, this beautiful country. And uh, we just want to give, give something, give something to this church that started in 2022 during our first visit here. We realized and we have continued to realize that the electricity goes off quite frequently during the services. It sh shuts down the sound and the instruments and the fans. And so when we went back to Rhode Island after the conference here, we began to pray because we have our Women of Judah Conference every May. This year will be our 13th Women of Judah Conference. And during the weekend, we present a project and a challenge to the women that attend that conference. And I will tell you that every year that we have done that, the money that comes in is absolutely amazing for the number of women that we have. And so we went back and for May of 2022, we presented the project of helping this church with a better system of electricity. Pastor, we were trying to figure out a way that we can be a blessing, that we can help you, and we found out that an electrical transformer would be the way to go to be able to stabilize the electricity. So we found out the cost and the money that was raised by the women's ministry, women of Judah, we as a church added to it. So I have some good news for Good News Assembly of God, that we would like to present your pastor $8,500 to buy a new transformer for the electricity of the church. The Lord of God. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet and give God praise.
We are grateful that we are partnering with another Assembly of God church in Liberia, and we appreciate the connection that we have. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for your participation. We are being a blessing, both near and far, for the glory of God. Amen. I'd like to just share with you for, see, when I was in Africa, we didn't have to worry about the time. Um, I didn't get up to preach until like two hours into the service. Um, and But you uh, Americanized people uh, I just, you know, used to an hour and a half. And um, once the clock strikes 12, all the mice run out or however that <laughs> goes. But I uh, just want to briefly share with you uh, one of my highlights was what happened uh, on the night services. This was something that was added to the program uh, that we didn't uh, participate in the last two years, but it was uh, an outdoor crusade, and I didn't know what to expect. Uh, the church, they just set up a platform in front of the church, and uh, the, it wasn't like a street. It was more like a cul-de-sac. It was a turnaround area you couldn't drive through. So they just had this area that was just full of seats and then people on the perimeter and houses and on porches and walking through were able to hear the gospel. And my task, my, my uh, challenge was uh, to preach a message of salvation. And to be honest with you, I was prepared. I had messages. But when I went there, I just felt an uneasiness with what I had prepared. And uh, I was just in the hotel, and I'm, I'm basically begging God, give me a message, God. I, I've got, like, time is ticking away. My time is here. And it's like, i got to go and preach. And, and you know, I, I realized that without the help of God, I was just, I was toast. Um, I didn't have anything. But God, once again, just in his faithfulness, as we just show up, he shows up. Half the battle in life is showing up. It's the truth. Half the battle is showing up, uh, and, and the devil fights you every step of the way. And, but God was so faithful. We had altar calls, in, and the first night, I think it was nine people that came to, to accept Christ. The next night was 29, and the final night, I don't know how many came. But we, we had the opportunity to share the gospel and preach a salvation message and call people to follow Jesus Christ. And they were going to seal the deal. They were going to seal it by having a water baptism on Saturday morning at 6 a.m. I said, i got to see this. How is this going to work out? Like, what is this going to look like? Um, six in the morning. And so, um, but, but one of the biggest highlights was, uh, my wife alluded to it, there was a young boy, actually he's in his late 20s now, but he grew up in front of the church all these years. The pastor told me afterwards that they had ministered to him all from when he was a, uh, a young little toddler, shared the gospel with him, ministered to him, and the night that I preached, he accepted the Lord for the first time. This was a young boy from the community that they had seen, you know, he saw them come in and out of church. They had ministered to him year after year after year, and he accepted Christ. Can you put that picture up for me, please? Here is the man that accepted Christ for the very first time, was in church. He got baptized Saturday morning, was in church Sunday morning, became a part of the church, got up, and you should have seen, when they introduced him, we thought he was like a, you know, a Liberian rock star because everybody, we said, who is this guy? Everybody, the church erupted in praise because they knew who he was and they remembered him over the years having ministered to him, and this was the very first time he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. So that was an amazing joy. And uh, I would like to share with you just a little clip, if we can play that a water baptism clip, uh, just for you to see. This was just such an amazing experience. 6.30 in the morning, we are in the same Atlantic Ocean that we are just the other side of the, of the continent. <laughs>
The Zabe told me he couldn't swim. <laughs> so I said, I will hold on to you. I don't know who was going to hold on to me with those waves coming in. Um, take, just give me five minutes. Who will give me five minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Open up to the book of Acts. I just want to share uh, from Acts chapter 8, just tying this all together. Pastor Mike, how many have uh, attended the water baptism class? 18 are going to be baptized in three weeks from today, right? Three weeks. But after this message, I think we're going to have to have another class um, because I want to just share with you Acts chapter 8. How many of you in Acts chapter 8? I want to read verses 26 to 40, and I just want to just exhort for a few moments. You all gave me five minutes. I added it up, and I think it was about 45 minutes, so... Now, an angel of the Lord, verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go down, go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. He preached Christ to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that he saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And Philip was found in Azastos, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now I want to share with you just for a, a brief few moments from this passage of Scripture. April 7th, 2024, three weeks from today, we will have a water baptism here in our Sunday morning service. I want to make a couple of comments from this passage of Scripture. Um, you know, we had that joy, that, that added blessing of doing a water baptism in the Atlantic Ocean at 6.30 in the morning for Pastor Zabay, myself, Bernard, and, and my wife Lisa to be walking uh, to the ocean at that time, walking down the road, and to see 40, 50 people gathered at this early hour of the morning,
praising God, rejoicing, excited about following Jesus in the waters of baptism. What a thrill it was to be able to see that happen that early in the morning. How many of you are glad we're having a baptism at around 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning and not uh, in, in, in the ocean? It would be like a polar plunge at this time of year. But here is Philip the Evangelist. How many of you know we're all called to be evangelists? Evangelist is someone who shares the gospel. Matter of fact, Philip was, was not an apostle. He was one of the, the first leaders in the church, a deacon, a servant, one who served in ministry. But God just called him to go down to Samaria, and he was preaching the gospel, and the revival broke out. A, a massive revival. The whole city was coming to hear the word of God being preached. And this is going on, and, and God is using Philip. And this is an, a, a great experience, a great encounter. But then the Spirit of the Lord speaks to him and says, I want you to go to the desert. Now, I don't know about you, but if I heard that voice, I would have said, that's the devil. You know, here I am in the middle of a revival. Many people are getting saved. God's doing some amazing things. And here I hear a voice saying, all right, I want you to go to the desert. But you know what? God was directing him by, uh, to, to, see, to meet with one man, one person. Verse 27, the Bible says there was a, an African man of great authority. The Bible said he was a treasurer. So he was uh, a prestigious uh, um, a significant person. He was the treasurer uh, for the country of Ethiopia. How many of you know he, had, he was in, uh, responsible for a lot of money? Now, he was riding a chariot. In those days, most people walked. If you were well-to-do, you rode an animal, but if you were really well-off, you rode in a chariot. I mean, this was, this was a, a Mercedes-Benz, this was a, a Beamer, this was the top-of-the-line uh, chariot he's riding in. What's interesting, he had just come from church, he had just come from worship, and he's reading the Bible while he's driving along. I'm sure he wasn't, uh, you know, he, he wasn't driving and, 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 and steering the wheel and reading the Bible. He was in the back, uh, and he was reading the scriptures. So what impresses me about this is that he's a man of great authority. He is a treasurer, and he's not of Jewish descent. He's an Ethiopian. He's an African man. But he goes to Jerusalem to worship, and he's coming back, and he's reading the prophet Isaiah. So let's look at it this way. He went to church. He's reading his Bible, but he doesn't know Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that something? Think about that for a moment, right? He's reading the Bible. The Holy Spirit directs Philip. Philip uh, goes along, hears him reading Isaiah, and, and, and he asks him. Uh, humbly, he says, do you know what you're reading? And the man says to him, uh, with another humble response, he says, how can I unless somebody teaches me? He could have said, hey, I'm a treasurer. I'm responsible for, for millions and millions of dollars. I just come from church. I've been reading the Bible. Of course I know what I'm reading. But he says, how can I? And he asked Philip to join him, to come and sit with him in the chariot. And coincidentally, well, how many of you know there are no coincidences with God? God is sovereign. God is in control. God knew that young man, his name was Nush, Nush. He knew that he would be there, that I would be coming from the United States to be at a conference in Liberia, that I would be preaching, that this young man would be sitting there hearing the word of God preach, and that would be his time to accept Jesus. Only God can put those pieces together. Just like in this passage of Scripture, Philip hears the voice of God, is led by the Spirit, comes to this, this, this African man reading from the book of Isaiah, and that very passage of Scripture prophetically speaks of the coming of Jesus. And what, is, what does Philip do? He preaches Jesus to him. He just begins to preach Jesus Christ. He preaches about his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, his burial and his resurrection. How many of you know Jesus Christ is the gospel? The good news is about Jesus, that he can save your life, that he can heal you, he can deliver you, he can forgive you, and he can bring you to heaven. Now, what's interesting in this passage of Scripture is that the Bible says 
that as, as Peter is, as Philip is preaching Jesus to him, verse 36, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the man said, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Now, you know what, you know what impresses me is that Peter, uh, Philip, uh, jet lag's kicking in. I'll forget my name in a couple of seconds. Philip preached to him, and in his message, he mentioned baptism. Isn't that interesting? The, the man said, his water, what hinders me from being baptized? He was basically saying, wow, you, you shared about Jesus' life and his ministry and his death and his burial and his resurrection. You also shared with me that water baptism is a, an outward symbol of something that takes place in the heart of a person that they in turn go into the water and they, and they as a rep- Jesus being the representative, the one who died and was buried and rises up. So we go in the water and that symbolizes our death to self, our death to the world, our death to the old life. And then we rise up to walk in newness of life. That's the gospel. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it means you die to your past, you die to your sins, you die to the world, and you rise up to walk in newness of life. If you are born again, the scriptures say to be baptized. Now look at this man. He says, what hinders me? What hinders me? I want to ask some of you, what hinders you from being baptized? Now, let me tell you a couple of funny stories. Uh, I knew of one man. He didn't come to this church, but I knew personally of this man. Now, he was a little older gentleman, and he had hair. Now, you know, some old people, they, you know, the hair stops growing up here, but it just grows here. So what they do is they let this grow so that they can. I had a couple of uncles like that. You know, uh, and, and, and they're here. There's no hair up here, but this hair, if they let it down, it would be down to here. So what they do is cover the, cover the dome. So I knew of this man who had hair like that, and he would not get baptized because he didn't want to mess his hair up. He didn't want to come up out of the water and everybody see his bald spot and his hair is dangling down there. That's a true story. What, what hinders me from being, what hinders some of you from being water baptized? If you believe in Jesus, the command is be baptized. My mother, in her 70s, she got baptized in water at our previous building, Admiral Street. My mom was deathly afraid of water. She was very afraid of water, but, but God gave her grace. She overcame her fear, and she got into a baptismal tank, and I had the joy of baptizing her in her 70s. She was afraid of water. Some of you might have a fear of water. God could give you grace. So he asked, he says, what hinders me? I ask you this morning, what hinders you from being baptized? If you're a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized in water, and and you know what the Bible says? They went down into the water. Uh, Now, uh, uh, you know, some of you might have been baptized as a baby. God bless you, but that is not the same biblical baptism. When they were baptized in the Bible, they went in, they were submerged in water. When you were baptized in an infant, you didn't have any choice in the matter. But when you follow Jesus, you have a choice. You make a decision. And, and look what Paul sa- uh, P- Philip says. He says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. That's the, that's the crux of the matter. And he answered, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you believe with all your heart. The word belief means to commit to, to entrust to, to have confidence in. And biblically, when you believe in Jesus, it means you are trusting him for your salvation. It doesn't just mean I believe. It means I'm committing to. It means I'm determining to follow him because I believe in him. I'm putting my trust in him. So faith is not just I say I believe, I truly believe. I believe enough to get into the water, and identify with him, committing my life to him. How many of you know there's a difference between saying, I believe and and believe and truly believe in? You know what the Bible says in James? It says even the devils believe. You know know, Satan believes, he has a better belief system than, than most Christians. 
He believes in God. He believes in eternity. He believes in the word of God. He just doesn't have the faith that, that really committed to it, and he will never be saved. He cannot be saved. But, but he, the Bible says the devils believe. Some Christians believe, but they never commit to. There's a story told. It's a true story uh, of a man who would, was, was doing a high-wire act from one side of Niagara Falls to the other, from the Canadian side to the American side. And he would get into this wheelbarrow. Uh, he would push this wheelbarrow across the high wire, and he went from one side to the other. And the people are cheering, and the people are, uh, you know, just, just, wow, look at that, and they're so excited. And so he comes back to the American side, and he comes down, and he said, how many of you believe I can do this again? And they all shouted, yes, yes, we believe, we believe. And he said, okay, who wants to get in? How many of you know that's truly believing? Everybody shouted, believe. nobody was willing to get in, so they didn't really believe he can do it. They just thought from a distance. And there are many of you here this morning, you say, I believe in God, I believe in the Bible, but are you willing to put your faith and trust do you really, really believe? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went into, down into the water, and he baptized him. Wow. I wish I was there for that Bible study that Philip gave to that man. I don't know if it lasted an hour or two hours. I don't know how long it lasted, but he preached Jesus Christ. He preached water baptism. I'm sure he preached repentance and faith, and he preached fellowship. He preached church attendance. I mean, he preached the whole gospel to him. He preached so much that he even got water baptism in. Pastors, leaders, I think we need to preach water baptism a little bit more. But we, we just bought a, a new tank, so, so we're going to do more water baptisms. Amen, Pastor Mike? Uh, uh, we're gonna be, you're going to be able to, to try it out for the first time. we got this big, it looks like a giant feeding trough. It's one of those metal containers. And so we're going to do it old school, amen? And, and so we're going to have it in three weeks. So I want to ask you, what hinders you from being baptized? If, you've, if you say you're a follower of Jesus, if you, if you believe in him, then you should not allow anything. That, that African man said, what hinders me? You know what? Really nothing. I'm not going to let anything hinder me from obeying the command of Jesus to be water baptized. Would you stand together with me this morning? I want to ask you that question. You know, the way they did it in Africa, I just love the African culture because they're just old, it's like old school. They just do it, right? We had, we had a crusade, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. The people that accepted Jesus, they, they stayed at the church Friday night. They didn't go home because if they went home, they might not come back, the distance, the travel. They stayed at the church. They got, in, they got teaching and instruction. Now, we ended at what time? 8 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, maybe later. Uh, so, so they had to break everything down. And then, then these 43 people that were baptized, they stayed at the church. Uh, they tarried. Anybody know what tarrying means? You Africans know what it means. All night. Um, some of them prayed. I'm sure they slept a little bit. But they all got up in the morning six in the morning or actually earlier to be able to walk to some of them drove some of them walked some of them were shuttled to the ocean but think about it they accepted jesus and then they got baptized i, I think that's more biblical than somehow some some ways we do it in, in in the u.s that's old school but it's good school amen but they just they just believed and they obeyed this morning i want to ask you are you willing to, to believe and obey the command of Jesus. We've had classes already. Uh, Pastor Mike, would he say 18? Signed up. There's still room for more. Let's pray together. Father, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, 
God, would you awaken in a desire like this African man who says, what hinders me? I want to be baptized. God, speak to hearts. God, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would make the gospel real to your people, that you will touch each and every one, Lord. Father God, I pray, Lord, these next few weeks as leading up to Easter, God, that you would just save family members, save co-workers, save people we've ministered to, we've invited. I pray, O oh God, that Easter Sunday would just be the beginning of an outpouring of your spirit, of souls being saved, of lives being changed, of people coming into the church, not necessarily from other churches, but from, from the streets, from people that don't go to church, people that are being saved, those that we're witnessing to, those that we're praying for. Father God, we pray for a harvest of souls, God. We pray, oh God, mobilize your church. God, let us become like Philip, the evangelist. Let us begin to share the gospel like never before. Let us begin to have an anointing like never before to share the gospel, Lord. God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. If you want to be baptized, there are a way to sign up online and cards. There are cards out there. Don't hesitate. Don't put it off. Obey the command of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you.